chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following interactive performance is a second round entry in Chilling Tales for Dark Nights 4th Annual Evil Idol Voice Acting Competition. And you, listener, get to help decide who advances to round three. Voting is simple. Following the performance, simply click the thumbs up icon on this video if you'd like this contestant to move forward or the thumbs down if you'd like to see them be eliminated. Voting on this entry will conclude one week after the date of its posting. Thank you, and good luck to all of our contestants. It was the sound of my sound's voice that woke me. Matty was shaking my arm, mumbling the same thing over and over. His voice sounded tired, but urgent. Dad! Dad! I shifted and opened my eyes. The bedroom around me was dark. A slither of moonlight leaked in from the skylight on the landing, enough to pick out Matty's silhouette at my bedside. I tried to rub the sleep from my eyes as I pushed myself up on one arm. What? What is it, mate? What's going on? Dad, you have to come. I saw something. What do you mean? What time is it? I reached over to the bedside table and tapped my phone, bringing the screen to life. 2.48 a.m. I rubbed my eyes again. My head still felt jumbled from sleep and the half-memory of some dream I'd been having ran through my mind like fog, something unpleasant. I tried to grab onto the memory but couldn't. Did you have a nightmare, buddy? Was that it? No, I mean, yes, but it wasn't in the nightmare that I saw the thing, Dad. That was after I woke up. I woke up and I... Hang on, hang on, wait a minute. Maddie's face was half-hidden in the shadows. I reached out and held his arm lightly. Tell me what happened slowly, mate, and start from the beginning. What was this nightmare you had? If I'm honest, I only asked the question to try and calm Matty down, help him get his thoughts in order. I didn't really need to ask it, though, because I already knew the answer. The poor kid's been having the same bad dream ever since me and his mum split up. Ever since she moved out a couple of months back, Grace left me for some rich guy she works with and she took our son with her, stuck me with a dog in an empty house. I suppose I should count myself lucky I still have those, but if I'm honest, it's hard to see a silver lining at the moment. And it's especially hard when I see the toll the whole thing is taking on Matty. The kid started wetting the bed again. Hadn't done it in years, but now Grace says it's almost a nightly thing. He'll wake up in the early hours, sometimes screaming, and his sheets will be soaked through. Grace isn't exaggerating either. The poor kid's done the same thing almost every weekend he's been to visit me. Sodden pyjamas, cries in the night, bags under his eyes at breakfast... When I ask him about it, he always says the same thing, too. That he'd been having bad dreams. The same bad dreams. A nightmare where he's lying in his bed, trapped, and the devil is standing outside his room, tapping on the window, trying to get in. His mother and I broke up, and now the kid sees fucking Satan whenever he shuts his eyes. Like he's in hell. I'm no therapist, but I don't need a qualification to know how badly we fucked him up. To him, the world really is ending. All of these thoughts and memories whirled through my tired head as Matty stood over me, pyjamas still ruffled from sleep. You can probably guess what conclusion I came to, that when the kid said he'd seen something, it was all part of his nightmare. Bad dreams blurring into real life, but what he said a moment later made me pause. It's nothing to do with my nightmare, Dad. Matty shuffled on the spot, rubbing one arm. It was something I saw in the kitchen. I think someone might be down there. Somewhere on the ground floor of the house, as if to prove Matty's point, I heard a soft creaking sound. Matty stiffened, but I didn't pay it any attention. My house is like any other Victorian property. Now and again it creaks, floorboards expanding, pipes in the wall. The neighbours? If you jumped at every little sound, you'd be constantly on edge. I was also busy running what Matty had just told me back through my head, trying to make sense of it. It was something I saw in the kitchen. It took me a moment, but then I got there. The pet camera. That had to be it. A month or so after Grace and I split, in an effort to cheer Matty up, on one of his weekend visits, I bought a little camera for the kitchen. One you can link up to an app on your phone. The camera sits in a little tower on the floor, and the idea is you can tune into it to keep an eye on what your pet's up to. Our chocolate lab, Bella, is about the only thing that can bring a smile to Matty's face these days, so I figured he'd like to be able to check up on her. 
watch her snuffling around in my kitchen even when he's at his mum's new place, speak to her through the mic. The little tower even stores dog treats inside it, which you can fire out of a little launcher by touching a button on your phone screen. Matty loves it. As I pushed myself into a sitting position, the conclusion I'd already come to was this. Matty had woken from his bad dream and he'd struggled to get back to sleep. So to calm himself down, he'd opened the pet cam app on his phone. Maybe he'd decided to watch Bella for a little while. The camera has a night vision mode, so he'd still have been able to see her. Obviously, it hadn't worked, though, and I thought I knew why. The night vision mode on that app is creepy. Everything looks odd. The picture is all grey and green, like in a horror film. No wonder it had made the kid even more spooked than he already was. Look, mate. I try to speak slowly and make my voice as reassuring as possible. I'm sure it's probably nothing. I'm guessing you mean you saw something on Bella's pet camera, right? You saw something on your phone just now. Matty nodded his head. Right, okay, well, trust me, I've looked at the app at night before too, and I'm not surprised it freaked you out. Something looks all shadowy and green, right? Like some creepy twilight world. If you saw Bella down there, her eyes were probably shining in a weird way, and... No, Matty's voice cut across mine. Bella was asleep, Dad. She was in her basket. My son glanced away from me in the direction of the open bedroom door, out towards a moonlit landing beyond. When he next spoke, his voice was barely above a whisper. It wasn't Bella's eyes, and it wasn't the weird light. It was the shadow, Dad. I saw a shadow go past the camera like something had moved in front of it and blocked the view. I opened my mouth to respond, but that was when the noise came. Not just a creak this time either, a sudden sharp crash from the direction of the kitchen. The stairs creaked softly below my feet. I crept down them as slowly as I could, willing them not to make a sound. It didn't work. The wood's old and noisy. Even in bare feet, I couldn't keep my steps silent. I was wearing only my boxes at this point, but my hands were full. Before I'd left Matty in my bedroom, I'd made sure to pick up the baseball bat I keep propped in the corner, just in case. If Matty had seen someone down there, a burglar for instance, I didn't want to meet them empty-handed. But even with the crashing noise I'd heard a moment before, I still wasn't convinced. Was my heart rate up a little higher as I worked my way downstairs? Sure it was. Was my grip on the baseball bat a little sweaty despite the cold? Absolutely. But that was only the adrenaline working through me, a natural, albeit irrational, response to creeping around the house in the middle of the night. If pushed at that point, I still would have told you that the noise was probably nothing, Bella knocking a chair over, most likely. And the shadow Matty had seen on the camera? Probably just the poor kid's overtired imagination, a hangover from the nightmare he'd had. Thing is, Matty's sensitive. I know he is. After he started wetting the bed, Grace took him to see the doctor, and we managed to get him referred to a counsellor, Someone to help him work through our separation. Both Grace and I speak to her regularly now that Matty's having his sessions and one of the first things she told me was how susceptive the kid is. I can still remember the exact words she used. Some children are far more emotionally vulnerable than others, Mr Norton. Far more at risk to big changes. Matty's mind is like a sponge. If he's happy, he can fill up with so much excitement he'll be fit to burst. But if he's unhappy, he'll feel it. He lets stuff in more easily than other children. That was a phrase that stuck out to me. I suppose being in tune with your emotions is a good thing, but when I heard the counsellor come out with that one, it didn't feel good. It filled me with worry and guilt. Shame too. I kept thinking about Matty's recurring nightmare. The devil waiting outside his window at night, trying to get in. He'd let something in all right. I remember thinking after I met with the counsellor, poor little bastard's in hell because of us. With these thoughts running through my head, I reached the bottom of the staircase paused and strained my ears. The house around me was silent. No sound from Matty upstairs, and no sound from the kitchen at the end of the hallway. If Bella had knocked something over, she'd obviously settled back down again now. She wasn't making a peep. I thought about switching on the downstairs light, then thought better of it. Somehow it didn't feel like the right thing to do. Even though the door to the kitchen was shut, any light I switched on would spill straight beneath the doorway. If anyone was in the kitchen, they'd know I was coming. There's no one in the kitchen, a voice in my mind shot back. Don't be an idiot, you're as bad as the kid getting yourself worked up over nothing. The voice was right and I knew it. But nevertheless, I still felt my hands tightening around the baseball bat as I started along the hallway. Just a little, just to be on the safe side. 
Halfway to the kitchen, another floorboard creaked beneath my foot. I froze in a pool of moonlight, strained my ears once again. The only sound I could hear was my own heartbeat. It sounded far too loud, bang, bang, banging in my chest like a trapped animal. I rubbed my eyes and felt sweat on my fingertips, forced myself to take another step towards a closed kitchen door, and then another. It was almost within reach now, close enough to open. All I had to do was reach out a hand, turn the knob, and push. So why don't you then? whispered the voice in my mind. Stop fucking around and get it done so you can go back to bed. Riding a wave of sudden frustration at myself, I stepped forwards and gripped the doorknob, twisted and shoved. The door creaked inwards and I felt myself tense, tightening my grip on the baseball bat. Something was wrong in the kitchen. I knew that straight away. Something was wrong. But at first I didn't know what it was. I could hardly see a thing. Weak street lights shone through the windows at the back of the house. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to push the darkness away. It was enough for me to make out shapes, though, objects hiding in the shadows. I could see the outline of the fridge on my left, humming away softly, and beyond it the little dining table. On the floor by that table was a chair on its side and a thought. That must have been what the crashing sound was, flashed quickly across my mind. It must have been better after all, I told myself. She must have knocked over the chair and... Bella. The thought of my dog was what triggered the first realisation, the first realisation of what was wrong... Whenever I walk into the kitchen normally, Bella is there to greet me. She's always there to greet me. Even if she's not ready and waiting on the other side, the first sound I hear when I open the door is her claws scrabbling against the kitchen tiles. Only now, standing in the kitchen doorway, I couldn't hear her. I couldn't hear anything. And a moment later, as my eyes adjusted to the kitchen's darkness, I saw why. Bella was sitting in the middle of the floor, perfectly still, facing away from me. Her eyes glinted in the darkness like glass beads, staring at something I couldn't see. Bella, what's up, girl? I took a step forwards into the kitchen and shivered. That was when I realised the other thing that was wrong. The room was cold. Not chilly like rooms at the back of a house often can be, either. I mean, it was cold. It felt like I was stepping into a freezer. I felt a draught of icy air brush my right side, and when I turned in that direction... I saw what had caused the drop in temperature. The back door was standing open, wide open, the darkness beyond it stared back at me like an eye. Over in the middle of the room, Bella began to growl, a deep, low rumble. I turned back to her, but as I was about to step further into the kitchen, a voice stopped me. Don't. Stay away. I let out a yelp and spun round. Matty stood in the moonlit hallway behind me, his pyjamas hanging off him like a sheet. His eyes were wide with terror. As I stared at him, he lifted his arm and pointed a trembling finger in Bella's direction. Don't touch her, Dad. Please. It's too late. He's already inside. I could feel fear filling me up then, something close to dread, and because I didn't know what to do or say next, I did the thing that was most automatic to me. I flicked on the kitchen light. The room instantly filled with a yellow glow. It should have helped. It should have put a stop to the terror building in my chest. It should have ended the nonsense right then and there. When you're scared in the dark, turning on the light is supposed to make everything better. It's supposed to banish the fear and the unknown and the shadows. But this time, it didn't. I told you, Dad. Maddie's voice was a cracked whisper behind me. I told you he wanted to get in. I didn't respond. I couldn't. In that moment, when the harsh overhead lights lit up the kitchen, I could only focus on two things. The first was Bella's eyes. Those eyes stared blindly back at me, rolled so far up in my dog's head that I could only see the whites. That was bad, but it wasn't the worst thing. The worst thing was the kitchen floor. The marks I could see on it running along the tiles. The tiny trail that led from the open back door to the spot in the middle of the room where Bella sat, unmoving. Not human footprints, but the damp, cloven tread of goat hooves. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, reminding you that if you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via either a thumbs up or a thumbs down vote. New entries will be posted throughout the month. Be sure to tune in and vote for each of them and help decide who becomes the next evil idol. Until next time, turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark.
dark night.